It's now 10 minutes, excuse me, 10 minutes uh, with, the, with the 10 minute grace, if you will. One of the uh, features of an academic institution is that when a lecture or a meeting is announced and a time is given and we are in our offices and we say, oh my goodness, it's uh, one o'clock, I guess I better go to that one o'clock meeting. And so uh, in any uh, self-respecting academic institution, you leave your office to walk to a meeting uh, at the time the meeting is supposed to start. And so then that is where this 10-minute uh, rule uh, evolves from in, in academia. Uh, so my name is Melvin McInnes, and uh, I am the principal investigator of the science that's uh, done that's then supported by the uh, Prechter uh, Bipolar Fund, by Prechter Bipolar Research Fund. And I have uh, served in that role really since I came to the University of Michigan uh, in 2004. I've, met Wally and her family, I think, within a couple of months of, uh, of coming here. And it has been just a phenomenal experience, a wonderful um, uh, road and trajectory that we've all gone down since the, um, since the work uh, and so it was, was begun here at the University of Michigan. Uh, the Prechter Fund, as many of you know, began in 2001, shortly after Heinz died. And, and I think around, uh, Leslie, it was about 2006 or seven that we started the lectureships. And so the, uh, what we, what the purpose of that was to identify someone in the field that was doing work related to what we were doing, preferably someone, uh, a collaborator, we would invite them and hold a lecture and bring folks up to speed with uh, what we were and are uh, doing. Uh, the, uh, today, we're just very excited uh, to have uh, our own Emily Provost, John Pate, uh, and to uh, talk uh, to us on the work that they're doing related to uh, use of technology and assessing uh, moods. I'm also very thrilled uh, to introduce to you some medical students, uh, Paula Goldman and Erica Pachaska, that are going to be presenting on some work that they did with technology in Quito, Ecuador. Uh, my wife is uh, Sophia Mariver, and she is an oncologist, and so we have worked from time to time in Quito, Ecuador, and this past summer we identified a, um, um, a trajectory or a process where we could work at a cancer center there in, uh, in uh, Quito, Ecuador. Now, one of the features of uh, depression and bipolar disorder is that it's affected by the environment and what better way to study how moods are affected by the environment than to study individuals uh, with, um, with, um, uh, with, with cancer. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm sad to, to inform you that Wally is not here today. She had uh, discovered a, an urgent obligation that she had to uh, attend to and so she sends her regrets and uh, will not uh, be uh, uh, attending today but is very much uh, with us as we will now, all right, so, um, uh, yeah, so there are all the things that, that, that I do, and uh, Kat, I also want to thank Kat uh, Bergman uh, particularly for her organizational skills uh, in organizing uh, this, this conference, uh, and also there are so many to thank and acknowledge here at the Depression Center in organizing it. I just uh, want you to know that when you see someone around helpful and, and um, guiding and organizing, uh, there's someone here, they're, they're here at the Depression Center and played a pivotal role in organizing uh, things around here. So uh, without further ado, uh, I want to share with you this black screen. No. Uh, oh, there it comes. <laughs> Uh, I want to share with you the video that uh, was made by the University of Michigan uh, system here in, um, and features Wally and her dedication to bipolar research. such a dynamic presence and such a, a, I mean, the amount of compassion and the amount of um, just fire and passion uh, and sacrifice and um,
September of 2001, when my daughter, three months after the death of her dad, had man a mania episode. My name is Stephanie Proctor, and, uh, and I, do, I have bipolar. It's an illness like heart disease. It's an illness that is affected or that affects the biology, it's expressed in the brain, and the individual themselves is truly a victim of their illness. We're losing a lot of people, as young as, you know, 13. It's an epidemic. I think that the science behind bipolar disorder is one of the most fascinating things that is evolving and emerging in the 20th, 21st century science. About two years ago in the summer, um, Melvin McGinnis walked into the laboratory and said that he wanted to start doing a project on induced pluripotent stem cells to study bipolar disorder. Induced pluripotent stem cells are derived from skin samples, from the adult individual. They have nothing to do with embryonic stem cells. What we're able to do is to coax these cells back to their earlier stages and then derive them into or create uh, neuronal cells, nerve cells, from these uh, stem cells so that we have cultures of brain cells effectively in a dish that we can um, then perform experiments on. Well, I first learned about <clears throat> Dr. Roche's work through my mom. So I didn't expect that we were going to find something so quickly. And, um, and my mom got so excited. I, she came to me and she said, Stephanie, they can tell, they can tell the difference. So when we looked at the genes that the, the neurons expressed between groups, between controls, and neurons that were derived from bipolar individuals, we found that the genes that they expressed were very different. It feels so powerful to, to be able to, to identify, I guess, on a physiological level that something is, is different. So I think we've got two things that are really important. I think we figured out where in development of a neuron things go wrong. And that's the first step, so we're misspecifying the bipolar neurons. We're telling them to be a different kind of neuron that they need to be. We need them to be inhibitory neurons in the cortex, and they're forming ventral derivatives. So hopefully we'll figure out how to go back and reprogram those neurons into the right cell type. Um, I think the other thing that we've been really successful in doing so far is to figure out that, in fact, the cells interact differently with each other in a dish than the control cells. So the control cells fire and they talk to each other with electrical and chemical signals. The bipolar neurons can do that, but they don't do it nearly as well. And so we hope for the first time we've got a model that will be able to add medicines to the dish and see if we can improve that firing. The experiments that we're doing with stem cells include testing the cells for their response to different medications, for different stress factors. And with that knowledge, we um, anticipate being able to understand the mechanisms by which these medications work. For the very first time, I think, we've got a cell-based model that we can hope to study the progression of this disease, to see how cells interact, to see the role of the neuron, the, the interacting cell, with the glial substrates, the supporting cells of the nervous system. And I think that this is going to be a really fruitful approach at teasing out the interaction between genes and their microenvironment. Um, and to eventually understand the genesis and therefore the treatment of bipolar disorder. The Prechter Bipolar Longitudinal Study here at the University of Michigan is a 10-year longitudinal study. It's our flagship project. Again, is the core study that we have for bipolar disorder. Um, and we're following close to 900 people. We already have a base knowledge of these individuals and we're building a data onion, if you will, around these patients. So we're getting a comprehensive picture. We're going to break this thing open and that longitudinal study is the real key as to how to do it. But answers generate knowledge. Knowledge generates new treatment. New treatments save lives, they save families. We have very smart people working on this, and I do believe that we have good technology that will get even better yet. And we're going to continue to follow that course because suddenly some of the answers are falling into place. And we really have tremendous potential to now have the breakthroughs that we seek. And really, I think the thing that's 
would be most helpful are hands. Um, just having more and more people working on this problem and working in, in different venues to look at the effects of, of diet, to look at the effects of stress, to look at personalized medicine aspects of the cells. And we just need more and more people to do that. For our Prechter longitudinal study alone, uh, as you can imagine, following 900 people and being in touch with them every two months takes a tremendous amount of effort. Every dollar counts. My name is Wally Prechter. I'm the founder of the Heinze Prechter Bipolar Research Fund at the University of Michigan Depression Center. And uh, I think if you can, if you truly believe in something, you owe it to yourself to, to help and to give and to make a difference. Because ultimately that is all you leave behind. Thank you. Uh, before I introduce uh, Emily Provost, I just wanted to show a couple of slides. So the title today, and was what was emphasized on the screen, is that there are so many more solutions. And I will be delighted to share with you one of my kind of core driving ideas that is going to, to demonstrate how we're going to tie in what uh, uh, Emily Provost is going to talk to us about, but uh, our, 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 our theme today is, is the computing, computer interface with, uh, with moods. And so the question that people will often ask is, what is a mood? And I just want to define a mood as a conscious state of mind, a predominant emotion. So many of you are in a particular mood here today, and there's a mood of anticipation, a mood of expectation. Of uh, pleasure of anticipating some uh, some uh, new knowledge, but that that is really what a mood is. Now, many of you often hear people talk about affect, and someone has an affective disorder. And I remind people that affect is the root word of affection, and it's often easy to understand affect in the context of affection because we all give and receive affection on a daily basis. And so here you see a family that has you know, the volition, the drive to look after our children, our emotion, the love that people have for their children and the thoughts and actions and the speech related uh, to the interactions with our families and our loved ones. And, and in fact, speech is one of the things that uh, we're going to be talking about here today. And Emily Provost is, is going, to be, going to be talking about that. But it's also important to appreciate, because a lot of things that uh, Emily is going to be talking about are going to relate to uh, the fluctuation in affect. And so, most of you are not in the same state of mood that you were in for, as you got up this morning. People's moods fluctuate over the course of the day. Uh, it is easy to understand if you think through the three components of affect, volition, emotion, and intellect, that in a depression, everything is at the bottom. Volition pretty much can be zero. You know, persons don't have the drive to take care of themselves, have negative thoughts, and feel bad and guilty. Uh, people have heard about mixed, uh, mixed affective states, and they are states wherein the volition is elevated, have a lot of energy knocking around, but the mood is low and depressed, and the intellect can have negative content or pessimistic. Uh, so uh, before I introduce Emily, moods, I just want to emphasize moods and affect, they're essential for our survival. Sugar is essential for our survival. All moods and affect, they fluctuate. Blood sugar fluctuates. Uh, so diabetes and depression are similar in that way because they're, they're both representing an essential element of humanity 
diabetes gets into the uh, pathological disease state and depression or bipolar disorder in, uh, in, that, uh, in that state. So with that, I want to introduce Emily uh, Moore Provost, who came to the University of Michigan approximately a year and a half ago. She was recruited to computer science and engineering in the College of Engineering. Uh, she has a very strong career in research in the interface with um, human computer interactions and how you can use computers and computer-based technology to assess mood and make, help us make diagnoses and help us to understand uh, the physiological and the emotional states of, of, uh, of man. Uh, we got to know each other approximately uh, one year ago. She came in to uh, see Dr. Graydon and was talking about her research, and I came in. And uh, it was actually, it was more than about a year and a half ago. It was in the uh, June 2012. And I says, gosh, well, we're working on this really exciting grant. And uh, so we had to uh, uh, move heaven and earth uh, to work with the administration to make sure we could get all the things in order uh, to get, uh, get her uh, engaged in this grant. So we're so excited. We're so excited that the grant was funded, had, had one of the highest scores that, uh, that I've seen. And I, uh, I'm, I'm convinced it's because of Emily's uh, work and, uh, and her contributions to that grant that got it funded. So uh, please welcome uh, Emily Provost. Oh, I know. So the great thing is at conferences, usually Provost shows up on the next line. So I always feel like I should put a little comma or something like that to just <laughs> artificially enhance. <laughs> so anyway, so I'm Emily Maurer Provost, and I'm an assistant professor in computer science at University of Michigan. And today I'm going to be talking about human behavior, understanding, and engineering, a partnership. And I'm truly excited to be here to talk about how these fields are coming ever closer together and how they can jointly learn from each other. So first, I'd like to talk about why emotion is interesting from an engineering standpoint. So one of the great things that we see today is we have this explosion of interactive technology. We have human ro uh, humanoids designed to interact as companions. We have little robots designed to interact in a rehabilitative context. And we even have computer avatars that are designed to teach children about emotion. But one of the things that research tells us is that if our technologies don't have a proper understanding of emotion, don't have a proper understanding of user behavior, then it's really, really, really difficult for them to interact with a population over time. And so we see, even from an engineering standpoint, emotion's incredibly important for our interactive technologies. But not only is it our interactive technologies that are driving emotion currently, we're also very interested to look at how we can understand overlaps with various fields, such as studying in autism. There's been a massive amount of research recently that's looked into how we can really understand communicative differences in children with autism and how we can use this information to kind of forward treatment and forward diagnosis. There's also a massive amount of work in depression, trying to understand how the vocal signal itself tells us about the internal workings of an individual's mood state. There's work in marital therapy, trying to look at dynamics between a husband and a wife as they go through counseling to try to figure out how we can understand attributions of blame or of humor in interaction. There's also general interaction dynamics. We're interested in trying to quantify and understand how individuals actually interact with each other so that eventually we can have human-machine interactions that are more natural. And also generally in psychiatric disorders, again trying to understand the cues that allow us to understand how clinicians are making diagnosis. And so I'm going to provide a brief video, but let me put it in context for a second. So this is an is a improvised scenario between two actors. The woman is going to be pretending to be an airline passenger, and she's been in Paris, so she's about to tell you, for three weeks, and the airlines have unfortunately lost her luggage. She finds this displeasing and is expressing this to the gentleman who's acting as a baggage attendant. Now, again, this is improvised, but it does provide a good indication of how we consider emotion in engineering, or generally. We flew in from Paris! I've been shopping for three weeks! So she screams, we flew in from Paris, I've been shopping for three weeks. And he responds with the incredibly appropriate, I'm very sorry. So from a human and from a customer service standpoint, perhaps it's not very surprising that people would respond this way. This is exactly what he's supposed to be doing. 
But from an interactive technology standpoint, that's actually a highly complicated interaction. You know, all of the data that we have access to that might have anger in it generally has one angry agent and another angry agent. Now, if the customer service agent was going to use these sorts of data mappings that we have access to, he would immediately get fired. And so what we'd like to try to figure out is essentially how we can interpret what's going on between two individuals, in this case, the other that the agent might not understand, using some sort of device, some sort of assistant. Now, in this case, the assistant might say something along the lines of, the other person is frustrated. This is a mix of anger and sadness. And then, instead of the uh, perhaps natural reaction of screaming in return, he comes up with the oh-so-appropriate, I'm very sorry. And so essentially what we're trying to do in emotion is understand this process with the goal of building these translational devices or interpretational devices. And so in the rest of this talk, what I'm going to be going through is an introduction talking about how emotion is actually used in technologies, um, how we specifically go about modeling the emotion process, how we understand mood monitoring, how we can even forward this to understanding how people are integrating audio and visual information during the perception process, and finally wrapping up. But first, I'd like to talk about what human-centered computing actually is. So human-centered computing is a, is a sort of a field that's, that's growing in enthusiasm recently. And our goal is to understand human behavior and human interactions using computational techniques. Now, the benefits of such an approach is that all of a sudden you get these objective and quantitative measures that not only can be used in interaction to sort of interpret your scene correctly, but can also be used as a part of diagnosis to understand how vocal patterns are telling you that maybe something is, is going wrong with respect to mood state or that uh, there's some sort of perceptual difficulty that an individual is facing. And so the motivation of this is to generally try to understand human behavior with the goal being to develop new algorithms and new ways of interpreting this information, this human communication data. But it's incredibly hard, right? This is why, this is why it's a research problem, because it's incredibly hard. And part of the reason why it's hard, it has to do with our ground truth. Now, our ground truth is provided by humans, but the challenge is, is that we're actually not super great at recognizing the emotion states of others. Now, you can actually trace a lot of conflicts back to this primary mismatch between what one person thought the other person was saying and what that person thought that they themselves were saying. And so the ground truth, essentially, in our data is even challenging. Now, another challenge comes from the fact that we have to figure out what sensors and what modalities we need. So I know that when I produce emotion, my voice changes, my face changes, my body dynamics might change. All of these things change. But the question is how, at what time scale, and all of these things. Now, we also have to consider how we actually quantify this information. My voice varies, and I, t I speak very rapidly, so my voice varies very quickly. <laughs> and I have to figure out how to take all of this information and quantify it in a way that's going to allow my system to actually process it. Now, data handling is also a huge challenge. If you're looking at sort of an interaction context, you might have 45 minutes of data with one label. Now, for a human, that's fine. You can look at this and say, oh, that's probably what happened. When my computer looks at it, it says, I have no idea where the important information actually is. So figuring out this is, is hugely important. Also, once we do all of this, we still need to figure out how to represent the information, the emotion, or the behavior in such a way that our computer actually understands. So representation is a challenge. Also figuring out how the environment affects what we're measuring. And so from an engineering point of view, our challenges are to adapt current technology, essentially taking things that work very well in speech recognition, so what Google Voice and Siri are doing, um, try to try to figure out how to create new representations or quantifications of the signal that we care about, and how to invent new modeling strategies that actually take advantage of the fact that we're fundamentally dealing with humans. But I would like to, for a second, focus in on feature extraction. So I'm going to use the word feature continuously because I can't get it out of my vocabulary. And what I mean by feature are measurements, measurements that might include things like the pitch of my voice, the volume of my voice, perhaps the movement of the lip corners of my mouth that might signify something like a, a smile. Fundamentally, features mean measurements. And so overall, what this gives us is this picture of human-centered computing, where you start off looking at the human themselves. Your goal is to extract out information from the human, and this might include things like their facial movement or their vocal behaviors. You then would like to do feature analysis and processing. You'd like to extract the information that matters and understand what those patterns mean via quantitative data modeling. But this is where the challenges start to come up. Because the way you're going to model the data, the way you're going to consider your data, fundamentally is, is dependent on who your interaction partners are. Your goal of modeling is going to be different if you're dealing with a clinician 
or an interaction partner who's a friend or a colleague or a boss. And so fundamentally, the way you model your data is going to depend on the person that you're interacting with. Similarly, the feedback system is going to depend both on the person producing the information and on the person receiving the information. And so fundamentally, what we have to try to figure out is how to create this, these, these pipelines that will allow us to extract information reliably. Now I'm going to provide another example that sort of details the emotional data that we might expect to receive. So this is data that was taken from a call center that has to do with lost baggage. And we can kind of see what evolves. Delayed bag. Yes. Peoria. Peoria. No. Peoria. P-I-A. No, can I talk to a person? <laughs> so she gets cut off, but she was going to say person. And so one of the, I'm going to actually just bring this picture up at the very end. Um, so one of the really interesting things you can see about this is certainly how emotion is varying in the voice. We get a clear picture that she's becoming increasingly enraged. And so our goal as engineers is to try to figure out the patterns, be it the volume of the voice, the energy of the voice, or the pitch contours, or these salient words, things that really string to, seem to strongly indicate negative affect. Things like no, or computer, or in the data set, all swear words, uh, tend to indicate <laughs> negative affect. And so as engineers, what we're trying to do is figure out what cues we can actually use to integrate this information. And so this field actually came up pretty much as an offshoot of speech recognition, which started in the 1950s approximately. Now, the challenges that were present in speech recognition had a lot to do with the fact that the way I produce the sound ah when I'm just kind of in a neutral frame of reference is very different when I say ah. And so one of the challenges that, uh, that a system has to face is that that is the same speech sound. But the problem is that it's modulated by my underlying emotion, or fake emotion in that case. And so as it turns out, though, the challenges that exist for speech, uh, sp uh, speech recognition, the fact that these modulations exist, is exactly why we can do emotion recognition. Because speech changes as a function of motion. Speech changes as a function of, of speaker identification. And so we can actually use these dependencies to try to understand the internal state of the speakers. And so fundamentally, what we're trying to an ask or answer is what do these patterns actually tell us about behavior? How can we build reliable models that use these patterns to fundamentally gain insight into human communication? And so one of the ways you can think about doing this, or one of the reasons why you might want to, is if you think about interactive tutoring. It's an area of research that's growing ever more. And the idea here is you have a kid who's interacting with some sort of a computer system, and the goal is to teach the kid something. Be it, maybe if you're thinking about a kid with autism, it might be teaching some kind of social skills or teaching some kind of emotion recognition. But the challenge that you know, teachers have, and certainly interactive tutors have, is that kids get bored, kids get frustrated, kids get confused. And so we need to make sure that our systems are enabled with the technology such that they can actually recognize these states of individuals so that the, the interaction can proceed in a way that's beneficial. You can also look at clinical assessments, trying to understand how we can go from high-level cues. So this is an example of um, diagnosing kids with autism, things that, that people focus on, things like social reciprocity or imagination or communication, going down to these intermediate-level codes, things like engagement or entrainment becoming more similar over time, or, or emotion or language ability, all the way down to the things that engineers we can, we can easily measure, things like pitch and energy and duration and articulation, speaking rate, lexical cues. And what we'd like to try to do is figure out how we can map from this stuff that we can easily measure from the voice up to these intermediate level features, up to these high level codes, such that we're forming sort of these automatic understanding for the information that these kids or adults are expressing. And so this takes us to this general framework of behavioral computing, where what we're trying to figure out are how behavioral cues modulate facial, vocal, and physical expressions. And our goal might be to help kids with autism better understand the emotions in their environment, or individuals with bipolar disorder, depression, or PTSD be able to understand the mood state that they're currently expressing. We can also look at embodied conversational agents or computer characters designed to interact with people, where we might want to make sure that they are, if we're doing this for an analysis perspective, let's say we want to teach a kid with autism about emotion, then we want to make sure that we are actually producing this information correctly, and if we're doing this from an analysis standpoint, that we're eliciting the data that we need to actually understand communication behaviors. 
And so again, to go back to this pipeline, it's a huge amount of research. And today's talk is going to just focus on this area of feature analysis and processing and quantitative data modeling. Although the work of our group actually does in include this entire area, it's a little bit too long for one talk. So we're going to be focusing down. And so now I'm going to move on to talking about emotion modeling. And so one of the reasons we're going to start with emotion modeling is that first I want to demonstrate that we actually can extract this information and that we can do it in a way that allows us to do further processing. And so the first question that as an engineer I must ask is how am I going to actually describe my data? Once I have an audio signal, how am I actually going to label it? And we borrow this from psychology. So there are two main frameworks that are used to label emotion. The first one is this continuous framework that says emotion can be described using properties. Things like valence, how positive or how negative is an expression, or activation, how calm or how excited is an expression. Another way of doing it is instead saying, okay, we don't need to talk about properties, let's just talk about labels. And so that is a discrete categorization. Looking at describing emotion instead in terms of labels like anger or happiness or sadness or fear relying on the categories themselves to allow our data to be separated. Now, it's quite a, it's quite a conflict that's evolved over time, um, but we happily just rely on both labeling strategies and avoid the, the discussion altogether. And one of the reasons why we can do that is that it's actually quite possible to map between these two frameworks. So just as a sort of cartoony example, again, valence is positive versus negative, and activation is excited versus calm. We can see things like happiness fall into the positively valenced high activation space. Things like anger are negative, they're negative emotions, and, but they're still very excited. And sadness exists as something that's, that's still negative but much calmer than, than anger, for example. And neutral is pretty much at the central. But the problem with these labeling strategies for engineers is that neither of them actually do fully what we need them to do. They don't lead to perfect disambiguation, which as engineers we absolutely need if we're going to model this information. So from a, di a dimensional standpoint, the difficulty is actually interpretation. So if you look at, so the, the one that I just showed is sort of our ideal case where everything's perfectly separable. But unfortunately, that's not what the real world looks like. Our classes of anger and happiness often have a large amount of overlap in this valence activation space. And so what that means is that when you try to actually classify these things, you end up with really, really low accuracy which might be fine because you can say, oh, I'll just exist in this space, no problem. But if you're dealing with interactive agents and you think your person's somewhere in the space and it's either anger or happiness, that's something that you actually need to know. <laughs> that's not something you're like, ah, I, I, I will not worry. And so you, know, the, so you say, okay, maybe instead I'm just gonna work with the labels themselves and I'm not gonna worry about these properties. But the problem here actually is interpretation, or sorry, is um, the fact that you're not capturing your full picture. So if you look at this first image, now again, valence is positive versus negative, activation is calm versus excited. Happiness exists in this positively valenced, highly excited space. Anger is negatively valenced and highly excited. And if you look at these things, these are just a bunch of utterances that everyone agreed upon were either happy or angry. You can see there's beautiful separation. And so again, you might think, well done. Anger and happiness as labels are perfect. Unfortunately, as the level of agreement decreases, you start to see massive amounts of overlap between these two classes, suggesting perhaps that the label anger and happiness are also not sufficient. And so what we try to do instead is you use a different quantification measure that says, you know what, I'm not going to try to recognize emotion as any one thing. I'm going to try to capture it as, human act humans, actually uh, as humans actually speak it, which are as blends. I might be interested not in saying, is something frustrated, yes or no, but what, is there any evidence that there's anger? Is there any evidence that there's happiness or neutrality or sadness? And what does that mean when it comes to kind of the interaction dynamics that evolve? And so the great thing about doing it this way is you can start to capture shades of emotion that exist and even represent ambiguous utterances, things that don't have labels. You can use them for classification, yet they're still interpretable. And so now I'm going to talk about how we actually do this. And so the, the one way we start doing this is by first collecting data. And the data that we work with is from an interactive emotional motion capture database. That's what that stands for. Um, it's five male-female pairs of actors, and there's audio, video, and motion capture. Uh, the actors are performing from scripts and improv improvised scenarios, and we have both uh, categorical and dimensional labels. And so our next question has to be, how can we extract features? 
And the, uh, the features that we use are either from the audio channel, they include things like pitch, the pitch of my voice, or the loudness of my voice. And we also use various frequency uh, ways of describing the, the vocal signal. And that, there's these things called mel, uh, mel scale filter banks, which I can talk about afterwards. We also look at various facial features that have to do with the motion capture points that we have in our data. And they include things like the movement of the mouth, or the movement of the cheek, the movement of the eyebrows, or even the movement of the forehead. And our goal is to say, OK, given this long stream of information, now I have measurements at each time step, which is actually 25 milliseconds, very short, that tell me what information is actually present in my signal. But the problem is that now I have this massive, massive string of data, and I have to try to figure out what to do with it. And so the first pass is what, what people normally do, is say, OK, I'm just taking statistics. So maybe over this entire utterance, my hypothesis is that when I'm angry, the mean volume of my voice is much louder than when I'm not angry, for example. Or the variance is much higher in my, my, the pitch of my voice when I'm sad. Or I might be looking at the quantiles, the lower 10% or upper 10% of the features, just trying to capture something that would be kind of typical of a given emotion. This gives us 685 features, which we reduce using this technique called principal feature analysis, which I can talk about later. And now we want to describe. Now we want to have some way of actually classifying this information. And so normally what people do is you put all the data into one pot, and you apply some incredibly complicated classifier and come out with some kind of an output label, which is a lovely, lovely technique and has shown very, very good promise. However, the challenge as we see it is that it still becomes very difficult to actually understand what about your data is leading to a certain label. And I would argue that one of the great things about taking an engineering approach to these types of signals is that you can actually begin to ask interpretation questions. Or given the fact I have an output label of angry, what does that actually tell me about the features that are present in my data? And what does it tell me about how they flow in time? And so doing it like this is actually quite challenging. So instead, we do something like this, where we still extract our features, but now we build a suite of binary classifiers, things that are detecting anger or not anger, happiness or not happiness, sadness or not sadness, neutrality or not neutrality. They're all just a suite of these binary detectors. They're essentially saying, is this thing present? The output of this is going to be a label that essentially says, yes, I think it's sad, or no, I don't think it's neutral, and some measure of confidence. What we'd like to do is compile this information into a four-dimensional representation, which gives us some estimate of the confidence of the presence or absence or each, of each one of these components. We call these things emotion profiles. We actually build them using this technique called support vector machines. And the goal of SVMs, that's the, the acronym for them, is to uh, find the maximal separation between two classes. We'd like to find the line that best separates class A from class B. And the nice thing about using this methodology is that it actually comes with this great interpretation built in. Because then anything that's kind of far away from that, that line or that hyperplane tells us that it's kind of a more confident way of, 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 that of understanding that class. And so our interpretation is we weight that binary output, the plus one or minus one, by distance to come up with a measure of confidence. So for example, if you consider angry red, not angry blue, things that are far away on the not angry side could be seen as a less confident rejection, where things that are farther away are a more confident rejection. Similarly, things that are closer to the hyperplane might be a less confident acceptance, farther away a more confident acceptance. And so why do we care about this? Well, the reason why we care is that it actually correlates really, really nicely with what humans tell us about the clips themselves. <coughs> so just as a reminder, happiness is positively balanced and highly activated. Anger is negatively balanced and highly activated. And what we see when we actually look at these classifiers one by one, so this is the happy versus not happy classifier, we can see that things that are far away from the hyperplane on the yes happy side are actually located in that stereotypical region of highly balanced, highly activated. And if you look at the things that are farthest away, they're actually in that stereotypical region of happiness, suggesting that this measure is actually capturing the way people are perceiving this information. And we can see that it's also true for things like sadness, for anger, oh, that's happiness, for anger, and even for neutrality right in the center. And so we think that this measure is actually capturing what people are doing quite well. And so if you look at all things that are labeled angry, all things that are labeled happy, and all things that are labeled sad, you can see that in general, our classifiers are able to pick up the presence of anger, happiness, and sadness, respectively. But we still have got a problem. And that problem is that audio is continuous. That's a discrete representation. So we're still missing out on all of the interesting temporal information that might tell us more. 
And so what we'd like to do is try to capture this sort of spectrogram idea, where a spectrogram is capturing frequency variation over time. We'd like to do that with a motion. We'd like to go from this to that, where this is, the, is an estimate for the presence of anger, happiness, neutrality, and sadness over time. And the reason why we'd like to do something like this is that we can start to ask these questions about what the dynamics are actually telling us, and even more importantly, if there exists structure that underlies how we fundamentally produce our emotional signals. We'd like to try to treat emotion as a language and try to understand how that language is structured. And so the future work that we have in this area is trying to find the structure that exists in emotional speech by identifying these consistent regions in time within an utterance that actually seem to have the signature of happiness, for example. And our goal is to improve emotion classification and even begin to mathematically characterize typical expressions of emotion. And I want to highlight the importance of this typical modeling. There are many, many, many uh, mental health uh, disorders that are characterized by atypical emotion production. Our goal of understanding typical emotion expression is to be able to build uh, a way of trying to understand not only if things are atypical, but why. And so again, fundamentally, our engineering approach is to try to characterize the short time variations that really inform uh, assessment with a goal of trying to build objective measures that can be used in the clinical process. And so now I'm going to talk about one of our applications that focuses on mood monitoring. And so I'm going to be talking about the Priori project, which is the project that Melvin spoke about in the introduction. And so our goal here is to develop new techniques to ecologically monitor mood transitions for individuals with bipolar disorder. And our motivation is that bipolar disorder and major depressive disorder are leading causes of disability worldwide with an estimated cost of $45 billion in the US alone. And fundamentally, there's also a limitation of care, specifically in rural areas. And you can see this very prominently when you look at the fact that 80% of, uh, of these prescription medicines are actually pres prescribed by primary care physicians rather than psychiatrists. And so what we would like to do is not only estimate mood state, but estimate mood state transitions with this goal of being able to fundamentally identify when care is needed and provide care in that case, essentially prioritizing care. And this is an ongoing collaboration between the Depression Center and the College of Engineering, specifically computer science. And so our fundamental goal is to take data that we receive from an interaction partner, from uh, someone speaking, and try to figure out how we can characterize this person. Not necessarily now in terms of anger, but now in terms of the presence of depression or in the presence of mania. And our goal is to really address the fact that users may have different needs at different times and try to understand what kind of care we can provide if we can really begin to automatically estimate the need. And so we have a, a phone project running. It's, uh, we're currently working with six individuals. We have a, f uh, a system that runs on an Android phone that's just collecting speech data. And our goal is to say this. Given this audio data, where this is the time, this is the frequency, um, and we're also looking at energy and pitch, what we'd like to try to figure out is, given an observation of a segment, can we estimate the probability that that segment it comes from speech that's either uh, from a um, um, state of mania or a state of depression? And because if we can do that, we can fundamentally change the way, uh, the way mood transitions are considered absent, absent um, established clinical intervention. Currently, as I said, we're working with six participants. Uh, we've worked with them for varying numbers of weeks. But our goal is to say, given the fact that we have data from a euthymic state, given the fact that we have data from either a hypomanic state or from a depressed state, can we begin to say, can we begin to characterize how these vocal patterns change with again bringing a goal of estimating mood state? Um, we've, had, uh, we've had success so far in doing this. We've looked at four participants for whom we have sufficient data. And we've seen that although the, the accuracy of these systems vary across individuals, we have been able to pick up cues that lead us to be able to estimate whether the individual is in either a manic state or uh, not a manic state. And we're also looking at the results with respect to depression as well. And so now this will bring me to the last area, which is focusing on perception modeling. So we've demonstrated that we can start to look at the speech that's produced and understand what information kind of modulated the, the production of that speech. But what we haven't said yet is how we can actually understand how perception works, right? We've got emotion production, which we've talked about, but emotion perception is still kind of an open question. 
And so what we'd like to do here is figure out how we can develop a new understanding of audiovisual emotion perception by actually leveraging new stimuli that we've created that introduce what I will, I will term emotional noise, which will become more clear in a few slides. So the question is really, how is data normally labeled? What is this innovation that we're producing? So normally when you look at audiovisual data labeling, you provide a bunch of data to, uh, to your human labelers, and then you get out a set of labeled data at the other side. But the challenge has always been to figure out what's actually going on during the human evaluation process. We're still not entirely sure how people are actually integrating the sources of, of audio and video information when they're making a perceptual evaluation. And so what we'd like to try to understand is how we can quantify this approach, uh, leading us to a new understanding of how people uh, use audio and visual cues when they're making emotion assessments. And so the reason why we have trouble doing this now has everything to do with correlation. Correlation is a large problem when it comes to modeling because what we're actually interested in is causation. Correlation is easy to measure, causation very hard. And so the reason there's this high level of correlation is that, as it turns out, uh, the information that's expressed on someone's face and on their voice are highly correlated with each other because they're fundamentally produced by very similar processes that occur at the same time. And so it becomes very, very hard to understand what audiovisual features are actually contributing to perception because of the high correlation that exists. And so our goal is to tease apart the effects of audio and video information in the emotion perception process by introducing noise and by introducing ambiguity. And it's based on this paradigm of the McGurk effect. Have people seen this before? OK, I'm going to ask everyone, this is going to sound silly, I'm going to ask everyone to not watch this video. Just listen to it. Ba, 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 ba. So I hope everyone in fact, did not watch it because I watched it by accident and heard something different. Um, but what you should have heard was the sound ba 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 ba. So now I'm going to play the same clip, but I'm going to take away all sound. I'll ask you to watch again. So for those who are not adept at lip reading, what he's saying is ga 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 ga. So now I'm going to play them together and ask you to watch them together. Ba, 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 ba. So what you may have heard this time was actually the sound da, 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 da. So this phenomenon was actually discovered by accident in 1976. And what it's really motivated a lot of emotion research as well, because it's this really fascinating depiction of the fact that our brain, given two different sources of information, somehow manages to come up with some sort of cohesive labeling for them jointly. And so we wanted to figure out if emotion, there's a similar process. And so essentially what we're trying to do is giving a happy clip and giving an angry clip, pull out a happy video, pull out the angry audio, somehow combine them to arrive at a video that has um, happiness in the face and anger in the voice. Again, with our goal being to try to tease apart perception by breaking the correlation that exists. This actually has been done before, but it's been done in very, very different and very constrained ways, either with a still image that accompanies a human voice, and the limitation there is that emotion perception is dynamic, or with an animated face and, a, and human audio, where the limitation there is that the, the voice is generally much more expressive than the face. We were using a face very similar to this. Um, and also, actually, we were using, we were using literally that animated face. <laughs> it was restrictive. Um, and also one word that, that was morphed. But the problem there, again, is that it's very, very short time scale. And so we wanted to create full, fully human, fully dynamic sentence level stimuli. So I'll show you what we did. A third volume remains to be published. I hope it's clear that was anger. <laughs> She's not very subtle as an actress. Um, but now look what happens. A third volume remains to be published. That's actually a happy voice that's accompanying her face. Or, a third volume remains to be published. That's actually a neutral voice. And so what we wanted to try to figure out was how changes in the vocal signal alone, or alternatively, if we looked at more clips, how changes in the facial signal alone actually would influence perception. And so I'm just going to provide a very, very quick, quick as a display of the results, because I'm sure I'm almost out of time. Um, but what you can see here is that in the original clips, these are the original audiovisual clips, this is happiness, this is anger, this is neutrality, and this is sadness. So happy again, positively balanced, anger, negatively balanced. 
And our question is, given the fact that we introduce this emotional noise, given the fact that we have mismatch across the two channels, can we understand how perception will change? Oh, OK. Oh, then fantastic. We found yes. <laughs> so one of the, th the things you can look at, again, this is the original for comparison. You can see that, again, happy is located here, anger here, neutrality here, and sadness here. What we're looking at here is where the happy audio has been fixed. So in this case, this is happy audio combined with ang uh, happy video, happy audio combined with angry video, happy audio combined with neutral video, and happy audio combined with sad video. This is valence perception, so positive, negative, and calm, excited. Now what you can see here that's really interesting is that in the case of anger, the, the emotion actually becomes more positive, and in the case of neutrality and sadness, uh, in the video channel, it becomes more activated, suggesting that when, um, when happiness is expressed auditorily with this mismatched cue, you can look at, how, at this biasing effect. But what's more interesting, perhaps, is what you look at when you have happy video fixed. So in all these presentations, there was happy video. There's happy video that is coordinated with happy audio, with angry audio, with neutral audio, and with sad audio. And so what you can see with these types of clips are the strong biasing effects that occur by introducing a new source of information on the other channel. Now what I don't have here, but I will go over uh, for a second, is what happens when we looked at the statistics of perception. So what we found was really, really interesting. So when you look at just Valance presentation, just the, just, sorry, when you look at Valance estimation, trying to label the positive versus negative aspect of the emotion, what we found from classification studies forever, forever and more is that video affects valence perception. We found that again, that the correlation between uh, the, the R-squared for our models was very, very, very high when we were using just video features. Interestingly, um, the same was true for activation. Video affected both valence and activation. And you can kind of see that, that this would probably be true based on these graphs, where there's um, in the audio domain, you see good activation and valence separation in the, the clips. And in the video domain, you see good valence and activation separation in the clips. So it's not very surprising. What was surprising is if you try to estimate how people will perceive these things, these emotionally mismatched in sources of information, you do it very, very, very badly if you're doing, using the wrong source of information. If you're trying to estimate valence perception for these mismatched clips using just audio, the cor correlation is essentially zero. Same thing for if you're trying to estimate activation perception using just video features. Again, the correlation was practically zero. But what we found was that you could estimate how perception would change using video or using audio, which we thought was a really, really, really interesting finding. But what we found overall was that uh, so uh, solutions like this, such that video has a stronger effect for happiness, and we can see that it was also true for anger. The other thing that's very interesting with looking at these types of studies is they give you fundamental insight into how people are actually using audiovisual features. So in this case, the thickness of the line um, is, corresponds to how often a feature was used in the models that we develop. And you can see that in the case of valence, generally a lot of the, fa the features in the, va the face seem to actually contribute to perception, but with activation, they actually seem to be mostly coordinated with speech, you know, mouth movement which would be um, very interesting because of the, the relationship between activation and the voice. We can also look at how these features change in time. So for example, all your plans go asunder. And so these types of modeling, these types of feature level analysis really bring insight into how people are actually integrating these sources of information. And so the last thing I'm gonna do is quickly wrap up and say, where are we now? So if you look at human-focused signals and systems, sort of this way of, of thinking about this human-centered computing, you can see we have sort of this pyramid moving from behavioral sciences to behavioral signal processing, or how we can extract and model this information, behavioral informatics and behavioral interfaces. We're looking at how we can quantify behavioral informatics with our work looking at, uh, at vocal expressions for individuals with bipolar disorder. We've, we're interested in trying to figure out what kind of as assistive devices we can build, looking at kids with autism and looking at individuals with aphasia. And we're fundamentally interested in how we can estimate clinical judgment, how we can use, uh, how we can use quantitative and engineering tools to provide a source that clinicians can use when they're making assessments of mental health. 
I would like to emphasize something I should have said right at the very beginning. When we are building these techniques, we are absolutely not trying to replace humans, ever. A, I think we are very, very far away from doing that. But B, fundamentally, it's not our goal. Our goal is to try to figure out how we can build these objective techniques, how we can build these objective technologies that will provide additional information that can be used during the clinical process. And so our work continues to be in perception modeling and expression modeling with our focus on assistive technology. Essentially, how can we use the engineering methodologies that we've introduced so far to build the next generation of assistive devices that include things like applications for uh, tablet applications, actually, for language learning for patients with aphasia, mood state tracking for individuals with bipolar disorder and depression, and dialogue modeling for kids with autism. And with that, I would like to thank my, my colleagues and our funding sources. <laughs> thank you very much, Emily, for a wonderful presentation. I just want to open um, uh, the audience for uh, questions. Um, we have a microphone here. Oh, I can tell. I have a lot of that. Um, the six people you studied were at the no. 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 The people that we studied, are you talking about our mood state monitoring? Yes. In our mood state monitoring, we're working with individuals who are enrolled in the Prechter Longitudinal Program. No, okay. Then I'm talking about the last six that you talked about, the end of your, the six individuals. <coughs> Android, phone, Yeah. Phones. Yeah, those are, those are people who are enrolled in the Prechter Longitudinal Program. Oh, they're not actors. Not actors. Okay. Nope. Actually, the, uh, you bring up a very interesting point, though. And the question, the question is, how can we consider, when we're looking at emotion modeling, what is the benefit to using actors versus using people who are not actors? And so one of the benefits to using actors is that you get very fine control over the data that you can actually model. If you look at the natural databases, they tend to involve lots of frustration and anger, resentment. <laughs> Because these are things that, unfortunately, are very easy to get from subjects. The frustration, there's a database that looks at uh, website forms that crash when you're almost finishing them. There's a, <laughs> there's a data set with, um, with children who think they're interacting with a, a Sony Ibo dog, those little robot dogs. They think it actually interacts with them, but it's pre-programmed and ignores them. Um, there's, a, there's a data set that looks at, oh, it's a talk show database in German that actually just has people yelling at each other for the entire time. So it's really easy to get negative states. It's very hard to get positive ones. And so one of the reasons why it's nice to work with active databases is that you get a little bit more of a range of expression. And the database that I talked about very, very briefly, and I'd be happy to elaborate on if, if people are interested, um, we were actually using scripted sessions, so plays with certain emotional targets and impro improvised scenario. The goal being to have people expressing emotion a little bit more truthfully than the clips that you saw at the very end. Thank you. I'm uh, going to ask that we do use the, uh, the microphone because uh, this is uh, going to be streamed and uh, there are people off-site that are listening, so sometimes it's better to have the microphone. So ma'am and then the gentleman in the front. Oh, okay. Um, I think it would be interesting to compare what um, the data that you're getting from your Android pho phone. Ha um, I don't know if you have the patients repeat a sentence or something like that with um, a family member's if a family member was given a positive negative scale and, and, w and they could give their own number and their own confidence level and then you could compare that. I think that would be absolutely brilliant. So there's this, again, you know, when you're dealing with these sorts of technologies, there are always there are ramifications of any choice that you make in the modeling process. And one of our challenges sort of that I talked about at the very beginning is the fact that labels of data change depending on who's actually doing the labeling. And I think it would be absolutely fascinating to try to get at kind of this felt sense for family members who, who know the, the individual so very well that they know what those variations actually mean. And so I agree that I think that would be a great idea. Hi. It, it seems to me that uh, you're concentrating on uh, verbal response and facial response. And I'd like to suggest physical, the rest of the body yes. become more involved. I'm thinking of two things, one that Microsoft game where people move. The connect, right. Yeah, the connect. Mm -hmm. And also the uh, motion sensors in some of the phones itself mm -hmm. might be another source of information. Absolutely. If you can distinguish that there is a difference oh, in how people act. 
Yeah, so there's been, there's been a lot of interesting work that's looked at body dynamics. Actually, one there's this great uh, McGurk-ish effect also that's looked at the mismatch between face and body gesture. And there's a great one where there's an image of a guy with a, I'm, I'm not even sure if the face is originally angry, but they, they put context cues. So in one, he's holding a dirty diaper and the perception is generally <laughs> that he's disgusted. There's another one with a fist raised and everyone thinks he's angry. And so context and body gesture are hugely important. Um, we're actually looking at instrumenting our phone with accelerometers right now. I have a student who's working on that, and we actually just got uh, approved to have the next generation of Connect when, it, when it's, it, it comes out. We're getting it a little bit early, which we're very excited about. Um, and so I completely agree with you. Body, ge body gestures are huge. One of the reasons why we start with just face and voice sometimes is that it's nice to have a more constrained representation so that when you're trying to search for things that will give you insight about emotion, you're searching through more of a restricted subset. But I absolutely agree that, that looking broader is the right idea. Thank you. In the back uh, there, gentlemen. Hi. Um, uh, when looking at individuals, um, it's 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 uh, it feels intuitive that you could track an individual and their speech pattern uh, and how they change as they uh, modulate through different emotion. Um, do you find a lot of concordance across individuals, and how does how do you have to inflect the model to capture that? And as kind of a, a side question, do you find that since speech is a regional construct, do you find differences across uh, people? coming from different regions with different speech patterns? Those are, those are all great questions. So w one of the things that you can note, actually, when you're doing these types of classifications, so when I was talking about the first section, we were doing entirely person-independent modeling, we call it, which is when you train a model on, we have 10 speakers in that database, so when you train a model on nine speakers and test on a remaining speaker. And the goal there is to try to tease apart these things that might be universals, I'm putting in quotes, universals, with respect to emotion perception, at least given the, the subset of the data that we're considering. What you can generally find is that the accuracy of your models are incredibly high if you start including the speaker themselves. The challenge, one of the reasons why people don't do that, though, um, is that it's hard to get sufficient amounts of data to tease apart, again, these correlational effects. Because it's hard to know if, the, if you're actually capturing emotion or if you're capturing something else that the person was, was, was performing while they were actually producing the emotion that you care about. It's really hard to tease that apart with a small sample. And so the reason people tend to look at person-independent modeling for a lot of the databases is to remove that effect to some degree. The last question you ask, I have now forgotten. What was it? Sorry. Regional, regional, regional. So that's a great question also. So generally when we do these types of modeling, we restrict to the US in general. We haven't restricted to regional um, characteristics yet. But I think that there's reason to assume that anything that also modulates the voice, be it accent, would have a strong effect on the modeling as well. I guess our hope is that since we're looking at slightly longer time frames than, than speech recognition, speech recognition models generally at 25 milliseconds, and the statistics that we look at are either over an entire utterance or they're over a, a window of about one second. Um, the reason why we do that partially is that we remove the effects of speech, because emotion is actually a modulation on top of speech. And so our goal is a lot of times to sort of discount the effect of speech, because you know emotion gets in their way, speech gets in our way. And um, so I think that partially the regional effect, at least when it comes to the way people are producing speech, is mitigated because of the modeling choices. I think it's, it's also really kind of a critical thing to think about, and uh, just with appreciation of the point about the family members, is that mm -hmm. one of the impetuses uh, behind of this project was that uh, when we talk to family members, one of the things that they will say is that, you know, there's something wrong. I can hear it in his voice, mm -hmm. you know. And so when we talk with our family and friends, when, you know, a good friend or a family member picks up the phone, we ha only have to hear five, ten words before you've got a, an immediate kind of an integrated sense as to what the mood of that person is. And so, uh, you know, so that's why I think your, your point about, you know, getting a family member's kind of an appreciation of it at the, at the same time. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, um, um, so we're, we're working with colleagues in China. Do you think it's going to work in other languages? Yeah, so China, Chinese is actually is, is a, an interesting challenge. And the reason why is that uh, both Mandarin and Cantonese are tonal languages. And so what that means is that the pitch changes as a function of the words that are being produced. And actually the kind of the prosodic patterns of speech are different for Chinese than they are for English in terms of emphasis patterns. And so 
I think that what we will have to do is, is look at how we can differentiate speech first factoring out the effects of the different prosodic patterns and the different, uh, I guess, frequency patterns that would accompany a different language. Mm -hmm. But I think that given sufficient amounts of data, there's reason to assume that it should work well. Yeah, the lady, oh, is it the lady there and then John? How did you pick mad, sad, glad, and afraid? I noticed um, you don't consider shame. Yeah, no, that's a wonderful question. So part of the, the reason why we choose the set of emotions that we consider has to do with, again, the readily available data. So the data in the, the IE mocap database that I was talking about, actually the labels come from the set, so I can get them all. Angry, happy, sad, neutral, surprised, disgust, excited, fear, and other. But the challenge is that if we actually want to model robustly, the only four that really have sufficient amounts of data are anger, happiness, neutrality, and sadness, and to some degree, frustration. Now, one of the things that I think would be very interesting is expanding further. Um, but again, the, the challenge is to make sure that you're, you're getting data that, that's shameful or that's, that's full of fear that actually, that actually are. And so from an IRB, the Institutional Review Board, who looks over all of our studies, it can sometimes be challenging to, uh, you know, to collect truly fearful data, for example. Thank you. John? I, I can use this mic here. Oh, here's one. Yeah. Yeah, Emily, thank you. And this is our, <coughs> excuse me, this is our future, I think, and we will be using these tools, and we already are in a number of worlds. And, uh, I think the question that I have is a little bit complicated. If we look at what you're doing, you have to make assumptions of where are your valence and activation and other kinds of things going, and that we're a neutral audience. Uh -huh. What happens if I'm the clinician and I happen to be depressed that day? How do I perceive yeah. things differently? No, I mean, that is, that's absolutely the challenge of these types of studies. So. You know, when I, was, when I was talking about earlier with this idea of looking at how ground truth is affected by the, labor, the labeler themselves, you know, if you look at, at research in depression or in bipolar disorder, um, you can see how the perception of certain emotional stimuli is, is different when someone is in the presence of a, a mood state. And so the challenge then is trying to figure out not only who your labelers were and how they interpreted the scene, um, but also, even in the case, let's say you have a naive labeler, what's the effect of having someone who's an expert versus having someone who's naive versus having someone who's a family member? How does that actually change the labeling space and how does that change your modeling space? And so the way we often mitigate it from an engineering side is having a large suite of people evaluate our data and start looking at, at, at average evaluations or removing people that we think may be outliers. But it's an absolute, that's absolutely an important question. And if I could just do something, I'm making an inference that not everyone in this audience knows the real definition and a framework of neurosciences of prosody or prosodic. Uh, can you do it? Yeah, so when we talk about prosody, at least in the speech community, when we talk about prosody, we mean pitch, how we're looking at pitch. We're talking about the volume of the voice. We're generally talking about the duration of specific uh, phonemes or speech sounds, things like ah, how long that is. We're also looking at uh, pause duration, so the pause between words or even depending on, for example, in aphasia, we actually see the pause between speech sounds as well. So when we're talking about prosody, we're generally talking about this framework of measurements. Uh, with that, uh, there's one final question I have for you, and that, and that is the use of this technology and now today, uh, you know, with the news um, that is on the channels uh, about, you know, the NSA and the listening in on these different things, and the way that you know, you're talking about the, the, the person interviewing uh, or with the, you know, the travel agent and the, and the passenger, where, where, where are these things being applied at the present time? Yeah, so that's a great question. So in terms of basic speech recognition, I mean, part of the reason why Google Voice and Siri work as well as they do is because Apple and Google have thousands upon thousands of hours of speech. And they can index very carefully exactly what your speech sounds like compared to you know, what their database has. Because again, I hope it, it's, everyone knows this, that the 
um, the speech recognition is not occurring on the phone. It's occurring in a, in a data server somewhere. And so the reason that works so well is that they have access to massive amounts of data. In terms of emotion recognition, it actually is applied in call centers. And so not, not all call centers, but if you ever get very, very angry and have decided that you've had enough of the computer system, you can try screaming at it. And not all of them, but a good portion of them actually have this technology where if you scream at it, you will be directed to a human. <laughs> Something to consider, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much. Yeah. That was uh, wonderful. So thank you very, very much.